It's time for you all to wake up and shift your paradigm. This world is the kingdom of darkness and we are living in its last days. It won't be long before the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. The heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat and the earth and everything therein shall be burnt up. The Luciferian elite have been setting up the new world order and now they've established the globalist beast system for the rise of that wicked one and revealing of the man of sin who comes after the workings of Satan. Don't take my word for it. Read the Bible and you'll know that perilous times shall come in the last days. And we are in the last days. Hello brothers and sisters, this is the Remnant Warrior from Kingdom Productions Network. I wanted to thank you all for watching this video and all Kingdom Productions Network content and ask that you please hit the like button because it truly helps the channel grow and new people see the content. And if you aren't already subscribed, please consider hitting the subscribe button and the notification bell so that you'll know each time we upload new content. Grace and peace. Good day brothers and sisters. I hope you are all doing well. And uh, today I am going to do another study on the book of Revelation. And today we are going to look at the letter to the church in Philadelphia. Now, we find that in Revelation chapter 3 verses 7 to 13. Now, to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and you have not denied my name. I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan, who came to be Jews, though they are not but are liars, I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have, so that no one will take your crown. The one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I will also write on them my new name. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now, <clears throat> first of all, if we go back to the beginning of this, we look at verse 7 and it says... Um, these are the words of him who is holy and true. Now, uh, we know that God is holy. We know that he is true. We know that Christ is peace. Uh, if we look at Ephesians 2 verse 14, we know that Jesus is the perfect peace of God the Father. Jesus is also the truth of God the Father because Jesus, according to John 1 verse 14, is the word that became flesh and dwelt among us. So the Bible is the word of God and that word has become flesh and it has dwelt among us as Jesus Christ. So Jesus is the peace of God. He is the truth of God because he is the word of God and he is also the righteousness because he will come again as the righteous lion of the tribe of Judah to judge the living and the dead. Um, he is described here as who, the one who holds the key of David. Remember that when we look at uh, 
the throne of God in Jerusalem. We know that it's the throne of David. We know that Jesus came from the bloodline of David. Um, <clears throat> David um, was one of the most well-known, or basically the most well-known king of Israel in the Old Testament. If you mention the name David, even to people who are not Christians, they will tell you, oh yes, David in the Bible, uh, the guy who was a shepherd, he slew Goliath and he became king. And um, David was a man after God's own heart, even though David conspired to commit murder, even though David uh, committed adultery with uh, Bathsheba, even though David once angered God because he wanted the census being taken, uh, which was actually him who listened to the voice of Satan. Um, <clears throat> David was a man like you and me. He had his flaws. And even though he had his flaws, God the Father loved him. He called him a man after my own heart. And it is from the bloodline of David that Jesus was born. If you go through the bloodline of David, you will see that all those who came from the bloodline of David were obviously all human beings who had flaws. They all had sins. They all did wrong things every now and then. And please note that I'm not trying to justify sin. Sin, um, I mean, the, the Apostle John actually said in one place that you senses of the devil. Um, and if we, we also know that if we sin, we are crucifying the Son of God all over again. Because then we claim that the crucifixion of Jesus in dying for our sins was not enough. But the fact of the matter is all of us are human beings. From time to time we, we stumble and we fall. And <clears throat> it's only by the power of the Holy Spirit that we can endure in the race. You know, in, in his letter to the Philippians, the, the Apostle Paul speaks of a race that is set before him. And remember, Paul had many hardships. And even though he had many hardships, he endured by the power of the Spirit in the name of Jesus Christ, all to the glory of God the Father. He says, <laughs> that he has the key of David. In other words, this refers to the throne of David. It also refers to Christ being in the bloodline of David, having the keys of death. In other words, Christ being born from the bloodline of David and eventually um, coming to earth in human form to die for our sins on the cross and in order so that we might have it, so that we may have eternal life. And having the keys of death in the 80s, um, for me is also, it forms a parallel with having the key of David. Because having the key of David means that Christ's, Christ opens the new Jerusalem for us. And the key of David means that if you understand that Christ came from the line of David, then you understand that Christ during his ministry on earth was 100% human, but also 100% God. He never sinned. If you understand that, you know that Jesus um, took on, basically, um, he, he became a suffering servant. <clears throat> he was despised by many. He became a suffering servant and conquered death so that those who have a relationship with him as their Lord and Savior may have eternal life. Now, the key of David um, goes along with this in the sense that if you understand that Christ came from the bloodline of David, that he was 100% human, but also 100% God, then you understand how Christ was actually humiliated by taking on the form of a servant, a suffering servant. Um, in the book of Hebrews, in the epistle to the Hebrews, we are told that Christ was made for a while lower than the angels. He is above the angels. He has a name that's superior to, to their names. He has received the name above all names. 
But for a little while, he was made less than the angels. And that was when he did his earthly ministry. So it was humiliating for him. But still, he loved us so much. God the Father loved us so much that he sent his only begotten son so that those who believe in him may have eternal life. He says that What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. You know, this is a great comfort for us. We know that God has a perfect plan for each and every one of us. The psalmist clearly says that before I was formed in the womb, you know, while I was being formed in the womb, uh, my days were known to God. I'm paraphrasing now, but that's what it comes down to. Um, even though before you were formed in the womb, God knows what your path held in store is going to hold in store. God knows what wrong things you're going to do, um, but He also knows what things you will do in order to glorify Him. He, he also knows when, He also knew back in, the, in those times, He also knew when we would be going on a straight path to maybe go on a different path, but then he comes um, being ever faithful, being ever patient. He comes, he leaves the, 90, the 99 behind to go and find the one who is lost. And the great comfort for us is when God opens a door in your life, no one can shut that door. God knows our days, the days of our lives, long before we were formed in the womb of our mothers. And all our days were written in His book. And He knows which doors He would open for us and which doors He would close. And it's easy when God closes a door in your life, it's easy to feel miserable and you know, say, oh, I am i don't know, God closed this door in my life. I feel so miserable now. But like someone once said, when God closes one of the doors, stand and praise Him in the passageway while waiting for Him to open another door. Don't despair. God knows best. He is almighty, He's omnipotent the almighty creator of heaven and earth. While he, when he closes a door, while you are waiting for him to open another door, all the while, while waiting, praise and worship him. Know and rest assured that he knows best. When he opens a door, no one can shut the door. When he shuts a door, no one can open that door. And this is what he also says to the church in Philadelphia. He tells them, I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Now, this reminds us of um, the Apostle Paul, who talks in 2 Corinthians 12. He talks about a people who boast, you know, the false prophets who boast about themselves. They are so wonderful. And then he says, when he when he speaks about himself, he refers to he refers to himself in, this, in the third person, and, and he refers to himself as a man who was taken up in heaven. He had this um, wonderful supernatural experience, and he saw there things that he is not allowed to talk about. And then he says, "But I will not boast in this." He says, "I will rather boast in my weaknesses, for when." I am weak, God is strong. You see, it's easy to fall into egoism, um, to glorify me, myself and I, and think, oh, I'm so good, I'm so this, I'm so that. But when you are doing that, you are basically um, being a mirror image of Satan. We know from Isaiah chapter 14, the five I will statements of Satan, it's Isaiah 14, I think, verses 12 to 14. It contains the five I will statements of Lucifer. He said, I will elevate my throne above. 
I, I will elevate myself above the throne of God. I will do this. I will do this. I, 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 me, myself, I. So if you are glorifying yourself, you are indulging in the flesh, not in the spirit. And obviously you are being a mirror image of Satan himself. Paul says, I will not boast in myself. I will boast in my weaknesses because I know when I am weak, God is strong. And it's only by His grace and by His power and by His love and His mercy and His righteousness that I'm being able to go on. I mean, go and read what Paul says about the hardships he faced. Um, many times he was hungry, many times he was cold, many times he, um, was, sh uh, he was shipwrecked and in, in one instance, he was beaten, he was thrown in prison. Also other apostles like Peter, Peter also didn't have a, an easy time. None of them did. Eventually, Peter was crucified upside down. Paul was beheaded. And so we can go on and name many examples of the early church martyrs. Look, for example, at Stephen in Acts chapter 7, the first Christian martyr. He did absolutely nothing wrong, but false witnesses were brought against him. He was taken out of town and he was stoned to death as if he was some common criminal and even in that traumatic horrifying hour of his death he cried out Lord please do not reckon them the sin he followed the example of Jesus who said Lord forgive them father forgive them for they know not what they do and you and me, when we face hardships like the church in Philadelphia, when we follow the truth, when we love the truth, when we give people the gospel, when we love God above all, if, when we love our neighbors ourselves, and despite all that we face hardships, know that the Apostle Paul says these are onslaughts of Satan. You know, it's, it's onslaughts of Satan. He talks about the, the thorn in his flesh, a messenger of Satan who was sent to harass him constantly. And he asked the Lord to take it away, but the Lord said, my, my uh, grace is enough for you. So um, messengers from Satan, uh, unclean spirits and so on, are many times sent against us to uh, harass us so that we know that we cannot fight the fight by our, by our own power. We cannot do anything out of ourselves. It's only by the grace and the mercy and the truth and the power of Jesus Christ through the powerful working of the Holy Spirit that we can endure through everything and that we can fight the good fight. I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars. I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. You know, so he says to them, listen, there are those who we refers to as the synagogue of Satan, who are liars, who infiltrate the church and who um, harass and accuse um, these faithful believers in Philadelphia. But the Lord says, I will eventually make them to come and bow down before you and acknowledge you. You know, this reminds me of what David writes in Psalm 23 when he says that the Lord sets a table in, before me in the sight of my enemies, in the presence of my enemies. You know, um, we might think that our enemies, when they, when they ridicule us, when they uh, make life tough for us, when they harass us, we might think, we may think that you know, we have to endure these hardships and when will the Lord take revenge? You know that God says that vengeance is mine. But, you know, the thing is that God has his own way of vengeance. And it's not for us to take vengeance. It's not for us to take matters in our own hands. God knows best, and it's not easy. It's so much easier to shout insults back at others, to humiliate others um, in reprisal, 
to the way they humiliated us. It's easy to slander others behind their back. But do we still love them? Do we leave the vengeance to God and say, listen, I don't like what these people or person did to me, but they are still my neighbor and I have to love my neighbor as I love myself because I love God above all. Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. You know, uh, there's, a, there's a treasure in heaven being kept for us. Uh, the Apostle Peter speaks about this. He says there's a treasure in heaven that is kept for us. Where is our focus? Is it on the earthly treasures or is it in the, on the treasure that we have in heaven? We know that Jesus Christ also said that do not gather for yourselves treasures on earth where people break in and steal it in, and, and where rust and moths um, damage it and so on. But um, your treasures should be in heaven because where your heart is there your treasure will be also. Where your treasure is there your heart will be. So if your heart is focused on the treasure that you have in Christ Jesus in heaven, then you know that that crown of glory that will be given to you, that that crown of, of sonship of God, this, having a sonship of God, being clothed, with, uh, with clean clothes, being given a new name, having that crown of righteousness upon your head. That is something that God promises to us and He never breaks His promises. That's the wonderful thing of it. The one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I will also write on them my new name. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So take close note, note. God says, I will write on them the name of my God, the name of the city of my God. Um, and I will also write on them my new name. It's threefold. So it's a threefold assurance that we are, we belong to Him. He assures us of that three times in such a, a small piece of scripture like this. What's important also is that he says, I will make a pillar, uh, the one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Now, if you go to Galatians 2 verse 9, in Galatians 2 verse 9, um, he mentions James, uh, the Apostle Paul mentions, mentions James, Cephas. Cephas is just another name for Peter. So it's James, Peter and John. Those esteemed as pillars gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship when they recognized the grace given to them. So they were esteemed as pillars. Now being esteemed as pillars in the temple of God also goes back to Proverbs chapter Proverbs chapter 9, when you look at Proverbs chapter 9, verse 1, Wisdom has built her house, she has set up its seven pillars. Now the seven pillars in the, in, in, in the house of wisdom, remember now this is wisdom, Jesus as the wisdom of God. Jesus, um, we know that in Jesus are contained the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, which is not the wisdom of this world. It's the knowledge of God, the wisdom of God. It's far above the knowledge and the wisdom of this world. Now, wisdom has built a house. She has set up its seven pillars. The seven pillars um, also refers to the sevenfold ministry of the Holy Spirit and it also refers to the seven I am statements that Jesus made in the Gospel according to St. John. 
So being one of the pillars in the temple of God means being one with Jesus Christ, being one with his seven I am statements, being one with the sevenfold ministry of the Holy Spirit. We will be one with God, just as we are one with Jesus in his death and in his resurrection. In the new Jerusalem, we will be one with him in his being. I, that I, I think in a certain, to, to a certain degree, it's too great for us to understand with our human minds. He ends the letter to Philadelphia with the words, whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now this saying of whoever has ears must listen. And along with that, we also hear um, Jesus said, those who have eyes to see and have ears to hear. Now this goes back all the way to, all the, way to the prophecies made by um, Isaiah. And the prophet Isaiah refers to this a lot. He says, let those who have eyes to see, let them see. Let those who have ears to hear, let them hear. In other words, don't put no evil thing in front of your eyes and don't lend out your ears to the voices of the unclean spirits. Listen to what the Spirit of God is saying. And you can only hear what the Spirit of God is saying if you have a relationship with Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And if you study the Word of God, and if you pray and you have conversation with God, that's the only way that you can hear the Spirit of God. So may our eyes and our ears remain open. May Jesus Christ bless all of you in abundance. He has given us life in abundance. May the Holy Spirit be with you as God comfort and protector. And in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, I wish that all of you will be blessed beyond measure. And I wish you only the best, and we will see each other, Lord willing, next time. Whenever that might be, we will see each other when uh, we will look at the letter to the church in Laodicea, which will be the last of the letters, then we will um, go on with the rest of Revelation. May God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit bless you. I love you all. Goodbye.